Excellent. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Rich, for the kind introduction. And I want to thank you and your colleagues on the committee for the invitation to participate in this symposium. Something that brings all of us together near and dear to our hearts is decarbonizing our future. Lots of different strategies. And uh, it's really an honor to follow up uh, Arun and Secretary Moniz from last night, who I think did phenomenal jobs of setting the stage, uh, the importance of the problem, the scale of the problem, uh, the needs for science and engineering to get us to where we all want to be in the future. So I'm looking forward to uh, showing some of the things that we're up to in our lab that really speak to these directions. And a lot of what you're going to be hearing about is new catalysts and new processes to decarbonize the things that we already use today and at scale. And so really to motivate this, let's talk about the, our modern fuels and chemicals industry. This is absolutely one of the greatest accomplishments in, of our species, of humankind over their centuries uh, of work in science and engineering to deploy technologies, to develop and deploy technologies, like for instance, steam methane reforming to make hydrogen. Will there be a hydrogen economy in the future? It's a question that is often asked. I would assert that at 65 billion kilograms a year production rate, which accounts for about nine kilos per person on Earth on average, and everybody in this room uses a lot more than their share of nine kilos per person, that is already a massive technology deployed at scale all based on fossil fuels, emits lots of CO2 in the process. Why do we go about making so much hydrogen? Well, one thing that we like to do is eat, and that means we like food. If that food comes from agriculture, Arun pointed out that agriculture is a major emitter, and a big reason why is from ammonia production. Here's another big ticket item, 150 billion kilos a year divided by 7.5 billion people on Earth, and that gives you about 20 kilograms <coughs> per person of year of ammonia production. About half that hydrogen that I talked about before goes into the Haberbosch facility. There's over 100 of these worldwide that crank it out by the megaton. Let's talk about gasoline. About 700 oil refineries on Earth processing on average about 100,000 barrels of oil a day. That comes out to about a trillion kilograms a year of refined gasoline product. That's only one quarter of all the fluids that are flowing through the, uh, the oil refineries. This is a particular facility from ExxonMobil in Baton Rouge, just to give you a sense of scale. And that comes out, gasoline is about 130 kilograms per person per year. And then, of course, there's plastics industry, uh, which is about 300 billion kilos a year, about 40 kilograms per person. And these are just some of the molecules that we're cranking out at scale and deploying globally that are reaching billions of people and ultimately improving quality of life. And all would be good except for the fact that this is all coming from fossil fuels and we would like to decarbonize that. So how do we go about thinking uh, on how do we do this? So uh, as Arun so eloquently uh, showed and pointed out, the price of electricity is dropping precipitously. It's fantastic. It's a wonderful change in our energy landscape. You can see just over the last 10 years or so, now the median price of wind and solar across the globe is at five cents a kilowatt hour and dropping. There's some sites, as you saw, about two cents a kilowatt hour. We think this has game-changing potential. How can we make use of it? And so when we think about what the future might be, what do we need? We need fuels for transportation. We need materials. We need plastics. We need fertilizer. We need all kinds of different molecules. There's 70,000 different molecules that we create globally, 70,000 different uh, chemical species that we need to produce that predominantly comes from fossil fuels predominantly comes from thermal and, and pressure-driven processes. The question is, can we use sunlight directly to do these chemical transformations? Can we use electrons that are coming from renewable electricity to do these transformations to either make the products that we need right away or we feed it into the modern chemical infrastructure as precursors that then we can use temperature and pressure to take it the rest of the way? The point is, is that there are a lot of different solutions that can fit within this landscape on how we develop new processes, new technologies, new catalysts that can uh, do these chemical transformations with a performance that is cost competitive, ultimately is what it needs to be with fossil fuels. So really what I want to talk about is really the, the catalysis challenges here and, uh, and where we're at and where we're going. So I want to share with you just a, a few numbers here if we want to change the world. These are targets that that, uh, that numbers that after discussing with many experts, colleagues of mine at Stanford, uh, friends and colleagues from other institutions, just uh, as goals that I think are ultimately going to reshape the world if we can get there. How about widespread renewable electricity at one cent a kilowatt hour? Certainly two cents will take it, three cents will take it. If we can get down to one, that would really be something. And, and there's a lot of reason to believe that we might be able to get there. We don't have the technology today, but uh, there's a path to getting there. Energy storage at $10 a kilowatt hour. So that means that, uh, as Arun showed, it was $150 or $200 is roughly what you expect per kilowatt hour coming out of the, the gigafactory using lithium ion batteries. Can we get down by easily an order of magnitude? That would be a game changer. 
Uh, carbon capture at $30 a ton of CO2, if we can get that from air or from point sources, uh, that would provide for a, a way to make use of that CO2 to create the, the carbon-based products that we need in a cost-effective manner. And then there's the electrolysis processes. So imagine a water electrolyzer, but not just water. How about electrolyzing CO2? How about electrolyzing N2? Uh, what we need is really low CAPEX, about 30 cents per kilogram uh, of CAPEX. These are just some numbers just to think about. Uh, why do I say 30 cents in this case? Well, a typical chemical product is about a dollar a kilogram. So if you want to add up the CAPEX, plus the, the operating X, which would be based on the electricity price or perhaps the storage price. You've got feedstock prices. We want to stay down to, say, 50 cents to a dollar per kilogram. And so 30 cents is where I came up with this. So uh, th with these kind of as technology drivers, we need a lot of science, of course, to build up towards this. And what I want to talk about are things that are involved in this box uh, with three key questions. First question, how can we accelerate linkages between new catalysts and new devices, new processes, new technology. So catalysis is going to be fundamental in all of this. And at the end of the day, we're trying to do chemical transformations of low value feedstocks into higher value feedstocks. We need to accelerate those reactions. But it's not just about the catalyst. We need technology to go along with it. Um, how can we use the electrode electrolyte interface to steer catalysis? How can we use what's happening on the liquid side to uh, steer the chemistry in directions that we want? Not just the catalyst, but the reaction environment. And when you're facing extraordinary challenges in catalyzing a reaction where, boy, it's really tough, uh, how can we work around those challenges? So these are three themes that I want to address today, uh, really looking at three different chemistries, making hydrogen from water, converting CO2 into fuels and chemicals, and producing ammonia, all with sustainable processes, all involving electrochemical transformations given the dropping price in renewable electricity. So let's start with hydrogen. Uh, first of all, what would a chemical plant look like? What, let's say, uh, let, we, I showed you an image of a steam methane reforming plant uh, based on fossil fuels. Methane comes in, you take the water, and you're basically stripping the hydrogen off of the methane to make your H2. This is a very different mode. This is you're feeding electricity in water. And of course, that electricity can come from anywhere, it can come from nuclear, come from hydro, come from fossil fuels, come from uh, PV. This is what the chemical plant would look like. This is a, a techno-economic analysis done by Proton Onsite. They're one of the market leaders in PEM electrolysis technologies. And uh, chemical engineering 101, you start by designing the reactor, and then you have to design the entire systems around it, right? So it turns out that you need a lot more than just a bank of electrolyzers. That's the gray boxes that you see here. You need power management. You need water management. You need hydrogen management, et cetera, et cetera. And so they costed this out for a 50 ton a day production facility. And they came out with a capital cost, less land, about 50 or 60 cents per kilogram of hydrogen. So that's not too bad. That's off by a factor of two from what I was showing our goal should be. This is, by the way, their kind of goal, if you know, assuming all kinds of good things happening in terms of tech development in that platform, this is an indicator that there's more that needs to be done. Now, if you want to. Yeah, we're, we're probably more like a dollar a kilogram today. More like a dollar a kilo. Uh, where's the bulk of that cost coming from? We need to reduce costs across the board. There's not one thing that's going to get us down to the cost targets that we want to hit. Uh, you have to reduce costs across the board. And certainly one of the biggest cost drivers, the 54% here, is in fact the stack. And a big chunk of that are the precious metal catalysts that they use. They use platinum and iridium. This is very common because in PEM electrolyzers, very acidic environments, most materials would corrode. So something that uh, I've certainly been thinking about, my research team we've been working on for quite a while, is how do we get rid of precious metals for both reactions, on the cathode and on the anode? So let me focus on the hydrogen side of the picture. Uh, many people to thank, including uh, Jabo and Jakob, two of our early stage researchers who really uh, kind of launched this effort in our laboratory. And where it all started was really from theory. So it turns out that you can learn a lot from other disciplines in biology, for instance, looking at enzymes such as nitrogenase and hydrogenase, theory that was coming from the Technical University of Denmark and specifically Barrett Hinemann and, and Jens Norsko in 2004 were really trying to understand how the biological systems were making their hydrogen because these enzymes are just as good as platinum at cranking out hydrogen, but they don't contain any precious metals whatsoever, as you can see here. Their theory was really pointing towards these under-coordinated sulfurs as being an interesting motif. And that pointed us in the direction of looking at uh, edges of MOS2. MOS2 is a, a very common catalyst that's used in the petrochemical industry. We can thank MOS2 for actually de, uh, for hydro-treating processes that ultimately reduce acid rain. 
So this is already at scale with the petroleum industry. And in these heterotreating processes, the edge sites of MOS2 do all the work. And uh, the hypothesis is that the edges should be also good for hydrogen evolution. So in fact, when I was a postdoc at the Technical University of Denmark working with Yves Korkendorf, we went about synthesizing and uh, imaging these nanoparticles, uh, very small nano triangles of MOS2. And we were able to show the edges are, in fact, very active for hydrogen evolution. And when I started my lab at Stanford, uh, Jabot and Jakob started working together and making all kinds of different formulations of uh, MOS2. So nanowires and nanoporous materials and small molecular clusters. And the long and the short of it, we made many formulations. The more edge sites you build into your catalyst, the better the catalyst is. And this is something that many research labs across the world have been uh, showing that their materials are also fantastic, all agreeing with this general principle. Here's some current voltage curves to show this to you uh, quantitatively. Zero is the reversible potential. If I hold my electrode at zero, then backwards and forwards reactions are, uh, are at equal rates, thus at equilibrium. And what we want is current voltage curve to get as close to zero as possible. As you build more edge sites into the material, you march closer and closer to zero. Though nobody on Earth has ever made a non-precious metal catalyst that can compete with platinum just yet, so there's still some room for improvement. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but uh, the idea is that the sulfides have really launched a whole new exploration into new types of ionic compounds, phosphides, nitrides, carbides, phosphosulfides, all kinds of different materials. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of steady progress of lowering in the overpotential needed to drive the reaction, which is a very good thing. And so we started saying, asking the question, well, will this actually work in a commercial type platform? And so uh, my PhD student, Desmond, who graduated a couple years ago, try to answer that question by taking a lot of these uh, sulfide and phosphide and phosphosulfide formulations and translating them into ink uh, technologies that then could be adapted by the membrane electrode assemblies that are used in PEM electrolyzer. So this is our own home-built PEM electrolyzer, just five square centimeters, very small device. And the idea is, can we actually get to the amps per square centimeter current density that you need? This is where technology runs today. It has to be, I think, at least one amp per square centimeter, if not two, if not four, if not eight for it to be viable. And so here's the iridium platinum base case using the, uh, the precious metal catalyst. And so to give you your one amp per square centimeter, it's about 1.7 volts. And what you see is if you swap out the platinum with the non-precious metal formulations, you lose about 0.2 volts, which is expected. Again, nobody on earth that I know of has ever made a non-precious metal system that is as good as, as platinum itself. And, and so this really poses a trade-off. Now, in a world where you're paying eight cents a kilowatt hour in electricity, I'd say, forget the non-precious metal system, go with the most efficient electrolyzer you've got. But as the price of electricity goes down, maybe the operating costs are, are no longer so important here. The capex might actually be more important, especially if you're operating at duty cycles less than 100%, which is where you might find yourself if you're uh, plugged into a, a photovoltaic or into a wind turbine. Now this is some of our own home-built stuff. Uh, we wanted to take this further, and so in a project, uh, an SBIR uh, funded by the U.S. Navy, which <clears throat> excuse me, happens to have uh, nuclear submarines that uh, they have a portable, with a portable nuclear reactor on the back and the cost of electricity, of marginal electricity is zero, they're interested in low-cost electrolyzers. And uh, so we, worked, we partnered with Proton on this project. Here's an 86 square centimeter device. Uh, they sell this, <coughs> platinum and iridium. Uh, and so what we did is we uh, synthesized, we meaning McKenzie and Lori, uh, synthesized cobalt phosphide catalysts as a powder. We shipped them over to Connecticut and uh, they integrated them into their system. Here's the current voltage curve. Now they're operating at 1.8 amps per square centimeter. That is their operating condition, 50 degrees C, 400 PSI hydrogen, et cetera. And again, you're seeing about a 0.2 volt difference uh, between the non-precious and the precious metal. Uh, because there is this gap in performance. Uh, but uh, so again, there might be an efficiency trade-off that we're willing to make. Of course, we want to make non-precious metal systems. If we can overlap platinum, then we can uh, check that box and say we're good to go. But another important question is stability. And so in, in this project, uh, we were able to run this electrolyzer. They were able to run it at Proton Onsite for 1,800 hours before they stopped the experiment. And the point is that 1,800 hours durability, the cobalt phosphide, lasted the whole way through with no signs of degradation. So it's really exciting that we can operate a real commercial electrolyzer on a non-precious metal catalyst that ultimately stem from roughly 15 years of research, all starting with looking at biology and how does biology do the chemistry. So that was, those were some examples I wanted to show you about trying to accelerate linkages between new catalysts and new devices and technology with uh, using really hydrogen as the vehicle to describe that. Let me transition now and talk about CO2 reduction, really to answer the question of can we use the electrode-electrolyte interface to our advantage. Uh, before I talk about electrochemical transformations of CO2, I just want to make one comment here that there are other modes of operation. I showed you this diagram of 
you know, you can take uh, renewables and plug them in in different ways. And if you made a renewable hydrogen, you could certainly feed that into the modern chemical industry to make uh, all the products or many of the products that we make today. And one of the projects that we're working on is really syngas conversion, trying to make, say, methanol. Arun talked about the importance of methanol or the possibility of methanol as a fuel. So here's our staff scientist and former postdoc, Melis, who's been working on thermochemistry and taking hydrogen. And one of the challenges in making methanol, it turns out, is that you really need to have the right feed ratio of CO and CO2. Uh, and so that is another unit operation. You need another reactor. You have your input stream. You need to do water gas shift chemistry to get just the right stoichiometry. Other, the, otherwise, the copper zinc oxide catalyst does not perform as well as it otherwise would. And we were trying to relax that constraint because ideally you'd like to operate on 100% CO2 or at least not care about what the feed ratio is. And Meli showed that this catalyst, uh, this, again, is really interesting. It's a molyphosphide catalyst. We leveraged a lot of what we learned on the hydrogen case for these phosphides, translated now to thermal heterogeneous catalysis, 30 bar pressure, a couple hundred degrees C in a packed bed reactor. And now, it, independent of the feed ratio of CO and CO2, this is a very uh, active and selective catalyst for methanol. So lots of exciting possibilities ahead of coupling, say, renewable H2 with CO2 captured from a power plant, CO2 captured from air to make uh, methanol in a more sustainable way than we currently do. So that was one example of thermal heterogeneous catalysis. Let me get back to electrocatalysis and talk about CO2. I, I showed you hydrogen evolution. One of the nice things about hydrogen evolution is that most catalysts that make hydrogen are very selective to making hydrogen. They generally don't uh, bother with anything else that's in the water. Uh, that's in the bath, but if you start throwing CO2 at an electrode in an aqueous environment, you have a lot of possibilities. First of all, you have their catalyst that could care less that CO2 is at the interface, and they'll just make hydrogen anyway. Um, or if you do, in fact, start attacking the CO2 molecule, you know, you could be making formate, you could be making carbon monoxide or formaldehyde or methanol or methane or, or C2 plus oxygenates or C2 plus uh, hydrocarbons. There's a lot of different possibilities, and I think steering the chemistry is one of the key challenges in this field. And so we've, I've had the, the great pleasure of working together with a, a number of fantastic scholars um, who've entered this space, Kendra and Natasha, two very, very early stage researchers, PhD students who've uh, since founded a company on CO2 electrolysis called Opus 12. Um, I want to uh, point out Steph Natopi is in the audience today. She'll be presenting a, a poster on some of this work uh, later this evening. And uh, Dr. Chris Hahn, who is a staff scientist in our group and has really been uh, phenomenal to work with uh, on everything CO2 related. And you know, one of our early results in this, uh, in this space, we started developing all kinds of reactors, actually, just to study the reaction and understand what's going on when you throw CO2 at an electrode in an aqueous environment. And this is just a piece of copper that we bought from Alpha Azar, 99.99% purity. We just cleaned it up, polycrystalline, dunked it in effectively Pellegrino or Perrier, whichever country you want to get your, your CO2 in water from. And uh, you apply some voltage and take a look at this amazing list of products that you can make. You can make methanol, methane, ethylene, acetaldehyde, propanol, allyl alcohol, all kinds of wonderful things. But the problem is that they all kind of come out together in the bath. And so separations is a nightmare. We need more selective catalysts. And so we've done a lot of work to try to uh, steer the chemistry from the catalyst side. How do you develop a better material, a better catalyst that can be selective? And more recently, we've been really interested in asking the question, what about the electrolyte? So let's get to that question. And I want to show you some of our results here. You know, you can take CO2 reduction in potassium bicarbonate, pH 7. You flow CO2 through water. It, it equilibrates to give you near neutral conditions. Or you can use CO as a, as a reagent. And CO obviously is a further down that reduction uh, uh, process, which is uh, maybe easier because it's already a reactive intermediate that has been shown to be important. But the nice thing about CO is it doesn't equilibrate with water. So you can do acid, base, neutral, you kind of pick your pH. So we wanted to do some comparisons here. And we took our reactor for CO2, which looks something like this, uh, that we had developed. And, uh, and then we engineered it for CO reduction. And CO is really challenging for a lot of reasons. Number one, it's obviously a very toxic and uh, nasty substance. So we do this in a fume hood, as you can imagine. Uh, another challenge that's not very soluble in water. So whereas CO2 is, say, 30 parts per million, CO is one part per million. And so you, mass transport can play a big role. You have to engineer a system that can get your, uh, your reactant to your surface so you can actually study the kinetics of the reaction and not be mass transport limited. When we do CO reduction in 0.1 molar KOH, we see a lot of the usual suspects that I showed you on the previous slide, 
uh, with uh, you know what copper would do on on with CO2 reduction in neutral. Uh, but what's really interesting is the voltages at which this chemistry turns on. So if I plot this on a reversible hydrogen electrode scale, so most of these products, the uh, reversible potential is around zero, so kind of where the cursor is on the screen. Remember that all these molysulfides and phosphides and whatnot operated pretty close to that reversible potential. To get the CO2 reduction or CO reduction to go, you have to go much more negative and potentially you have to put in a lot more energy to get that chemistry to go. And uh, very conveniently, when you do CO reduction uh, in base, as opposed to CO2 reduction in neutral, you gain about half a volt, which is not insignificant by any stretch of the imagination. So we can just compare here. So it's, again, ethylene or uh, ethanol or propanol or acetate. Here's methane. Methane is interesting. Methane doesn't shift quite as much uh, as the C2 products. And we wanted to understand what's going on. First question, is it a CO2 versus CO difference, or is it a pH difference? And so one way that we can do this in electrochemistry is we can, instead of plotting on an RHE scale, a reversible hydrogen scale, we can plot it on an SHE scale, a standard hydrogen scale that really takes into account pH changes. And guess what? These products overlap to a very large extent. Now, it's not a perfect overlap by any means. Uh, what I would say, to sum this up very briefly, is that if you do CO reduction instead of CO2 reduction, the chemistry turns on at, at either at the same point or earlier than with CO2. So I think there's something to be said with feeding CO versus CO2, but, but most of it is gonna be a pH shift. So we, here in, in the, the hollow versus solid red is ethylene, for instance. You can look at propanol in green. Uh, you can look at acetate in orange. So there are some differences, but they're much more on top of each other, as you can see. One interesting point is all the C2s are uh, in that boat, but methane is different. You can see in methane, the, the, the solid markers in, uh, for CO2 reduction actually onset earlier than it does for CO reduction in base. So the C2s are behaving differently than the C1, and that's an indicator of a different mechanism, and, uh, and that's important here. Now let me try to take this data a bit further. Let's, uh, let's distill this a bit. And let me show you, let's go back to an RHE scale, and let me show you one of the metrics that we pay close attention to is how many oxygenated species do you make versus hydrocarbons? Why do we pay close attention to that? Hydrocarbons are, of course, the largest products that we make on Earth that contain carbon, uh, but the oxygenates might be an earlier market point. They're generally higher value products because uh, the lowest value products are the stuff that we just burn, right? The, the more oxygenated species we can make polymers with, et cetera. And uh, so we pay close attention to that. And, and if I plot an RHE scale, it turns out that there's this really uh, clear trend where <clears throat> the further to the right that you go, the more oxygenates you make versus the hydrocarbons. And I think that makes a lot of sense because uh, the less negative you are, the less reducing power you have. So if you go more and more negative, you're going to really overdrive uh, making the hydrocarbons. And so if you're interested in making oxygenates, being closer to zero is better. This is a, this is a good thing. Uh, another thing that we pay attention to is CC coupling. So uh, again, with CO reduction, so these bars represent CC coupling. Uh, the lighter shade of blue and the pink refer to C2s and C3s. The C1s are dark, and as you can see, very few C1s uh, in the, uh, it, when you're doing CO reduction because you're operating at this very positive potential. It turns out that as you go more negative, you start making more and more methane. So that's another very clear trend. I'm going to get back to these in a second. Um, I also want to show you just something about the kinetics here, the partial pressure dependence of CO reduction. Uh, we took this, you know, one bar CO is our standard. Uh, we took that down to 0.01 bar. So remember that one bar CO gives you one ppm. Uh, by Henry's law, 0.01 bar is uh, about a hundredth of that. And so we can actually make our reactor, uh, we have enough mass transport, we can actually measure down to these values. And the point I want to make is that it's not very clear first order or second order kinetics here. It's a very complicated picture that to understand this fully, you need to have a complete microkinetic model that can map out all the different products. And we're working together with our uh, theoretician colleagues on, uh, on accomplishing exactly that. But just to show you that there's nothing simple about this chemistry. Uh, but there's more than just about the kinetics of the catalyst and how the interface might perturb that. Mass transport is also an important uh, element to all of this. And, you know, if you really want to understand the chemistry, you have to understand what are the species right at that interface. So this is what, uh, you know, the inner Helmholtz plane, the outer Helmholtz plane that we're talking about within half a nanometer or one nanometer of the electrode surface. What species are there? How much water? How many protons? What cations are present? What's the concentration of CO2? To really understand the kinetics of a process, you have to understand what is at that interface, and that is not an easy thing to probe. Uh, what you can get, though, is you can get at least, you know, what's getting up, snuggling up towards that interface by 
uh, by invoking a model. So there are a number of folks who've been uh, developing models for this. Uh, we're building off of previous work with the Poisson and Ernst Planck model uh, where you account for convection, diffusion, migration, and the reaction rates. And really the idea is uh, we know very well what our electrolyte composition is in the, in the bulk of the solution. As you run your reaction, how does the concentration of CO2 change as you approach, for instance, the electrode-electrolyte interface? What about, say, the potassium that was in solution? How does that change, et cetera, et cetera? How does the pH change? And so I just described how pH, higher pH could be a very good thing. It can actually really help CC coupling. It helps you with uh, making oxygenated products. But there's a problem with CO2, and that higher pH, uh, while it might be great for CO, is not so great for CO2. And I'll explain why. So you can take, uh, this is our, our data of looking at electrodes. I showed you some copper data earlier, silver and gold. I'll just kind of add to the mix. We can, of course, measure how much current we're flowing as a function of voltage. And we can, we're measuring, we're coupling our analytical chemistry techniques so we can figure out how much of that current is going to CO2 reduction versus hydrogen evolution. So that's shown in, this is the, the CO2 uh, reaction rate. This is the hydrogen production rate. And what you would expect is that under mass transfer limited conditions, you, this would flatten out and just continue flat all the way through. But no, it actually takes a tick upwards. Uh, you're actually getting, at more negative potentials, you're getting a lower reaction rate of CO2, and why is that? And our modeling shows uh, one important reason why is because when you get to these more negative potentials, uh, as you start cranking out more product, especially hydrogen, you start consuming protons off of the water and making a very uh, basic interface, even though the bulk of the electrolyte might be pH 7, the interface can go upwards of 10, 11 uh, pH. And at that point, you're hitting the second pKa of carbonic acid. So you're now shifting the equilibrium. You're, pl you're pulling even more CO2 out of that interfacial layer that you're looking to react. And thus, the reaction rate uh, goes down because the uh, CO2 concentration in that interface is plummeting. And CO doesn't have that problem. It doesn't have that equilibrium. It doesn't form an equilibrium with water the same way CO2 does. Um, and, and so this was teaching us, OK, so how can we get around that situation and, and just uh, FYI, we didn't just look at this modeling at these, we, uh, with these materials, we, we applied this model to every catalyst material we've been looking at. This is a few more and everything's consistent, just FYI. So how do we get around this issue? Uh, we came up with uh, an alternative scheme and that is uh, really trying to do tandem catalysis in a molecular scale. So I already showed you data of throwing CO at a copper surface that can do this chemistry instead of CO2, uh, but you're always gonna be limited about by how much CO you can actually get at that interface if you're using an aqueous solution. And so we were wondering if you could produce that CO on the fly. And so we used uh, coupled gold nanoparticles with copper surfaces, and gold is known to make, uh, it's a very selective catalyst for going from CO2 to CO. So the idea is that you have your, your electrode at a certain voltage where the chemistry of CO2 conversion is turned on for the gold and making the carbon monoxide. The monoxide, you can make a local overpressure of CO uh, that ideally your copper just does what copper can do and CC couple it and start making these types of products. And in fact, this was a successful approach. Uh, I'm showing you data here, for instance, making alcohol production, uh, predominantly ethanol. Uh, this is uh, gold in, in the gold color, we got copper in blue, and the red is copper nanoparticles sitting on top, sorry, gold nanoparticles sitting on top of copper. And what you see is a much, much earlier onset for alcohol production than what you would find with either copper and certainly gold. Uh, that, that accounts for about a 100-fold increase in the reaction rate because you're able to make that local production of carbon monoxide. Uh, so with all of this, we were able to establish some design principles for uh, C2 plus oxygenates. Basically, if you want to make oxygenated products that contain uh, a CC bond, you want to be operating as low of an overpotential as you can get away with. Uh, and I showed you that some products uh, are pH dependent and some products are pH independent. So really tuning the pH is an important piece of that puzzle. And all of this, was, so all this fundamental insight was really pointing us in the directions of some, uh, what could we do with this? And we said, we think mega high surface area materials are the way to go, uh, specifically with copper. So digging into the literature, uh, supercapacitors are one of many energy technologies that people are looking at. Uh, in supercapacitors, what you really care about is having mega high surface area. So uh, we just grabbed a synthesis from the literature from many years ago on making really high surface area copper. Uh, these are nano flower. Uh, configuration and uh, we just, uh, I don't think the morphology is all that important, it just happens to have roughness factors of about 400, so if you're looking at one square centimeter of electrode, that's equivalent to 400 square centimeters of surface area. And we were able to, when we did this chemistry of CO reduction in base, uh, in, in a regime that we think is very helpful for steering the chemistry, uh, we see almost 100% 
of our electrons going to C2 plus oxygenated products. And uh, that's very exciting. It's still not just one product. We're making uh, acetaldehyde and acetate and ethanol. Uh, but nevertheless, these are very important products. And it, if you start tilting your electrode more negative, exactly as our modeling would suggest, you do increase the reaction rate. But you start, start, you start making hydrogen. You start making hydrocarbons uh, because you're favoring that chemistry. So certainly uh, still a long way to go. But this is an example of how you can just take a a piece of copper, it's really nothing fancy about it. It's really about the electrolyte and the interface that you're trying to steer. All right, so my, the last uh, uh, area that I would like to touch on is now what happens when you start facing really hard reactions that are tough to catalyze. I showed you an example with hydrogen and CO2. We can actually do this chemistry. This is good news. Again, you can grab a, a pellegrino and a copper uh, and plug it into the wall effectively. You can actually make some interesting products. Uh, what about if you want to make ammonia from, from N2? Uh, that's a much, much more challenging reaction, and uh, thankfully, I'm working in a group with a great team here, uh, wonderful researchers in our group, and working with uh, researchers at the Technical University of Denmark, all uh, funded by a private foundation, the Willem Foundation, uh, that supports this work. And uh, what are we trying to do here is we're trying to figure out uh, different ways of making ammonia. I'm a very big fan of the Haber-Bosch process. Thank goodness uh, we, this process exists where we can actually feed billions of people. Uh, in fact, over half the fixed nitrogen in your body right now touched one of these iron nanoparticles that was sitting inside of a Haber-Bosch facility somewhere around the globe. Uh, and one of the challenges here is, as great as a process is, is a phenomenal process. It's very efficient, very good at uh, getting ammonia out the plant gate. We do have a societal challenge of getting that fertilizer actually into the crops. And it turns out that globally, more than 50% of the fertilizer of the ammonia uh, ends up as an environmental problem as opposed to going into the crop that, that uh, we're looking to eat one way or the other. So uh, this is a challenge in distribution that when you have really large-scale centralized facilities uh, such as a Haber-Bosch plant, um, it really depends on how close you are, how much access do you have, how does it logistically get to you. And this is very different if you live in California, if you live in Illinois, versus, say, if you live in Central Africa. Completely different dynamic. So the question is, can we decentralize such a process? And you cannot decentralize this particular process because the only way this chemistry goes based on the catalyst that we have today, you need really high pressures, and it's really tough to decentralize a process that operates at, say, 100 bar or 150 or 200 bar pressure. So can we do catalysis? Uh, this is the vision. If you have an agricultural field, it could be a garden in your backyard, or it could be a massive farm. Uh, can you have a solar cell that is hooked up with uh, wires such that it, you've got nitrogen in the air at 78%, you've got water in the air. Uh, obviously, it rains as well. When water is present and the sun is shining, and we always have access to N2, can you have a system that just makes ammonia just the right amount so that you're not overproducing and you don't need to have any ammonia shipped around the globe? So it's just making it kind of just in time. So this is the idea, but the, the challenge is massive from a selectivity point of view. I talked about the selectivity of steering, say, CO2 chemistry in water you know, away from hydrogen towards the sea products. We can do that. Uh, it's still a challenge, uh, but at least we can accomplish it to some extent. This is a much, uh, this is a different beast. This is uh, uh, some theory coming from Jens Norsko that shows this is uh, the voltage that you need to drive hydrogen evolution on these different transition metal catalysts, you know, typically around uh, half a volt or so from equilibrium or, or easier than that. Uh, to drive uh, ammonia synthesis from N2, you need at least a volt, if not more. And the point is, so any voltage that uh, any of this N2 chemistry turns on for these materials, you are making hydrogen by orders of magnitude. And, uh, and that's a challenge. If you're making, uh, if, if you're one part per billion NH3 is not going to cut it. That's way too much energy going to hydrogen, uh, not enough to the NH3. And, uh, and why is that? Uh, this is what I call an extraordinarily challenging reaction for a reason. The problem is what we want is to get N2 at STP to uh, absorb onto a surface and be ready to be reduced. Uh, but when you start operating at these very negative potentials, you have a very strong favorability to get protons down as hydrogen. You have a C of H sitting on the surface. It's very tough for the N2 uh, to get in there, to get reduced. So these are some strategies. I don't want to get into all the details here. Uh, but these are, it's kind of <clears throat> a little bit uh, counterintuitive. If you want to improve the selectivity for ammonia production, you actually want to limit proton and electron transfer rates, which is weird because you're trying to transfer protons and electrons onto N2 to make NH3. But this is, uh, we think there's some ways that that, uh, just from doing some very, uh, what I would call first uh, order kinetic analysis, you can, by limiting this proton and electron transfer rate, you can actually improve the probability of getting N2 down 
and uh, hydrogenating it. So going to non-aqueous uh, solutions, using self-assembled monolayers that inhibit uh, proton transfer, or different schemes to limit electron transfer at that interface. Uh, now, what can we do? Uh, so we're working on these strategies. This is, this is our strategy diagram. This is, this is exactly the things that we're working on our research group to tackle this problem. Uh, but there's also some workarounds. So these are all catalytic processes. Uh, we asked a question, can we uh, overcome the hydrogen problem by really separating the steps? And so this is not a catalysis uh, effort, in this case, a catalysis scheme. This is a, a cycling scheme where if you give me renewable electricity, we can actually, uh, we can dissociate the the N2 dissociation from the protonation. And so uh, we can do molten salt electrolysis. Where you put in some lithium hydroxide in a molten salt at room pressure, but elevated temperature because it's molten salt, so 350, 400 degrees. You give me renewable electricity, we can plate lithium. Once you plate that lithium, you can expose it to N2. It will form a nitride immediately. That's a very downhill uh, reaction thermodynamically. And then you just dunk that lithium nitride in water, and it'll hydrolyze into LiOH and NH3. Voila, you've made your ammonia. Now you just uh, recapture that. LiOH, put it right back into your molten salt, and repeat. And so we've been able to show that we can do this cycle over and over again, where 90% of the electrons in a very unoptimized situation, 90% of the electrons are going to NH3. That's a fantastic Faraday efficiency. Um, so that's really good news. Uh, the question is, how do you go about developing technology that can hit the cost targets? That's a question that we're certainly uh, tackling. Uh, but just to give you an idea of how much land area you would need, you might wonder that. So a hectare is 10,000 square meters. A typical agricultural field requires about 100 kilos of ammonia per hectare per year. If you have a 90% Faraday efficiency process, I just showed you one, you only need five square meters of solar cells. And so that would be, I asked our postdoc, Adam Nylander, if he could create a PowerPoint to scale diagram to show you what five square meters looks like in an agricultural field of a hectare. Bottom line is you don't need to cover up much of your agricultural field to provide the electricity for this type of a process. So this is an example of when electrocatalytic reactions are, are extraordinarily difficult uh, to drive, how can you work around them? So let me summarize and conclude. Uh, I hope I've uh, been able to share with you some thoughts on how there's a, a pathway to making some sustainable fuels and chem uh, chemicals. There's a, still a long road ahead. We've made a lot of progress in uh, hydrogen, uh, not developing non-precious metal catalysts and integrating them into commercial grade electrolyzers. Uh, I've showed you some work in, in uh, how we can use the electrolyte to really steer CO2 chemistry and CO chemistry to make desired products. And I showed you uh, some challenges and opportunities with doing N2 chemistry to make ammonia. Uh, let me conclude by thanking uh, all the wonderful team members that I've been pointing out along the way and many others who have contributed in different forms to the work that you saw today. Uh, the CO2 work was, uh, is predominantly funded by the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis and uh, previously by the Global Climate Energy Project, SBIR uh, with the Water Electrolysis. NSF uh, covered some work on some of the fundamental uh, catalysis work that we've been doing for photoelectrochemistry that I didn't have a chance to show today, and certainly Department of Energy, both Office of Science and uh, EERE, and the Willem Foundation for the work on ammonia. I thank you all for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thank you.